Welcome to City Gate Church. Thanks for joining us today. This message was recorded at our last Sunday service. We hope it blesses you. Today we're thrilled to have, as I've said, Pastor Chad. Pastor Chad has got a great heritage because we all know Dr. Richard. He's been coming for like 25 years every year. So he's sort of part of the furniture here and we give him honour where honour is due, of course. And he's had tremendous input into Citygate Church. Who knows Pastor Lindsay? Come and did the praise night. Well, that's, that's, that's your associate pastor and your worship leader from Now Church in Ocala, Florida. If ever you're in Florida going to see Disney, please, a couple of hours up the road, you go to Now Church. Phenomenal church, absolutely breaking through. But up in Boston, we have Pastor Chad. And your heritage is awesome. Your dad, mighty man of God, church leader. And to see the hand of God upon your life and just take that church over the last, what, 10 years, seven years? 10 years. And it's just going from strength to strength. They're just exploding. They're planning on starting their third service next month, which is great. So... Come and grab whatever's helpful from here and spit out the bones. And we stand with you for that. But can I ask you to stand to your feet and give honour where honour is due as I encourage you to go bananas, open your heart, give a shout as I encourage Pastor Chad. Come on, how good is our God? He is worthy, God. You are worthy of the praise, the honor. We give you this space, this place. Father, we pray that you rearrange our hearts. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Why don't you give your neighbor a high five if they're not looking? No, I'm just kidding. Don't slap them. Just... Now, fellas, don't greet them with a holy kiss. They might not like that. We had a powerful night last night in the engine room of young adults, well, we, we went there. There were so many questions and answers, but there was one question that came out and it said, it said, there is a really cute guy to my right. How do I take my shot without messing up? I stood on the chair and I started old school Arsenio Hall hooting and hollering. I just wanna know how'd that go? Who was it? So let's uh, reveal yourself. No. (laughs) Oh, it was so much fun. We went there. Uh, Can I also just, um, two things. Firstly, can I thank you? Um, Last night was something refreshing for me because I realized here in the UK, there's this desire to talk about hard things without being triggered. And the devil has a foothold in our country where people get triggered so quick they won't talk through situations and problems. And I was, I was so refreshed when a, a young woman stood up at the end and said, I wanted to argue with you about that, but I know it's right. Yeah. <sighs> that, that ministered to me, and I'm praying, would you pray for our country? Because we need a little bit of what you got in the rationale and the sanity and the Holy Spirit being able to speak and and receive it. So thank you for that. My girls, I am a a, a husband of, yes, a wife. We went there last night. Um, And a father of two amazing girls. I am a dad that is outnumbered by ladies. Uh, I think I have a picture. They, They send their love. That's Julie, my wife, and uh, Riley and Mackenzie, my daughters. uh, That's about a year old, but they're 15 and 12 now, so pray for me. Holy Spirit. Uh, People can lay hands on me after church uh, so that I don't lay hands on boys. Oh, Lord. Anyway, uh, I love your pastors. Pastors Julian and Sharon, they were with us in Boston, and we filled them full of chowder full of lobster. It was amazing. Um, But we honor you. We're thankful for you. And we know that although I've only been here a few times and you've only been to us, I know that this is something God is knitting together. And uh, I always honor Pastor Richard wherever I go. I am the Silas to the Paul. I'm always looking to learn from you. And I really wish I was the nine o'clock so I didn't have to follow all the truth bombs you dropped this morning. 
oh, I was a mess. Come on, let's pray again, because I need it. Father, I'm thankful for your presence. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place. We already know you've been moving freely, and we pray that you would continue to move on us, that you would show us what is true, what is right, that there would be a breakthrough spirit in this house. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. I want to talk to you today about breakthrough about breakthrough, because I know you guys are right on, right on the edge. Tonight is a breakthrough night for City Gates. It's a breakthrough night for Jesus and what he's doing in this region. And we're on the cusp of a breakthrough next month when we start our third service. I'm a fly on the wall today just to pick up anything I can pick up. But what I'll tell you is there's something so amazing about breakthrough, and I want to talk to you about the Lord of the Breakthrough. I want to talk to you, not the Lord of the dance, the Lord of the breakthrough. I want to talk to you about Jesus. And so we're going to be digging through chapter 8 today in Matthew. I love this chapter so much because the stories of Jesus interacting with a world in need is so important for our day. It's applicable to our worlds. When you look on your screen, when you look out your window, you see a world that needs Jesus. And so bear with me as I read a a little bit of scripture, a lot of bit of scripture, Uh, but I am a pastor that doesn't want to tell you what I think the scripture says. I want to read what the the scripture says so you get what the scripture says, not my opinion of the scripture. Are, Are you hearing me? I'm very aware as a pastor, sometimes people, they mean well to get into the Bible, but I want to make sure they're in the Bible on Sunday. I want to make sure they're not just hearing a flowery story of what I think about the Bible. I want them to dig into the Word because the Word does not return void. When it goes out, it makes change. It, whew, all right, I'm already preaching. Wait a minute, I started. Okay. Okay, so let's pay attention to the different needs Okay, we're going to see different needs. There are different needs in this room. There are different needs outside these doors. There are different needs. But we see a Jesus. We see a God who has the ability to fix all things. Have the ability to restore all things. Has the power to do what only he can do. So I I want you to look at the needs. I also want you to look at how Jesus responds to the needs. But to see ourselves in the story. See yourself in this story. Uh, your family, your friends in the story, and how it could be applied to your daily life. You ready for this? When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Say immediately. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony. You would say, well, why wouldn't Jesus want that good PR? Well, he was trying to continue to push the cross a little further out so that he could continue to do all God. He knew once, once the cat's out of the bag, they're going to crucify me. So he's saying, hey, come on, <laughs> just, just go do the very thing that God's called you to do with this, okay? So it continues... And it goes on to say, where was I? Mm, Look at them, all sorts. Okay, verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word. Say, say the word. And my servant will be healed. For myself, I am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. So I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, mind blown. He was amazed and said to those following him, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. I'm not done. This is like literally one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. So we're going to keep reading. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in a bed with a fever. He touched her. Say touched her. He touched her and the fever left her. And she got up and began to wait on them. Can I tell you, when Jesus touches you, you get up and you start serving him. You don't just say, that was awesome. Thank you very much. I'm going to get back about my life. When Jesus touches you, when he restores you, when he heals you, a heart turned right towards God says, what can I do for you? Can I tell you, you're about to enter a new season this evening where you need to see people in this church go from thank you to what can I do for you? 
There's going to be a need for more people serving in the house of God. There's going to be a need for more people loving on those coming in. And if God has touched you, stop sitting on your hands. Okay, that was a side note. <sighs> when, e when the evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities, and he bore our diseases. I mean, how many people are thankful Jesus took up our infirmities and bore our diseases? There is an opportunity for breakthrough that many are missing. There's an opportunity for you that if you're not looking for it, if you're not aware of it, you could miss it. I want to talk to you about the breakthrough. It's on the way. The breakthrough that is certain because our God isn't shaky. Hmm. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible because we see how God heals and restores all those who believe. Are there any people here today that still believe Jesus can still do it. Is there anyone in this room that's saying, you know what, I believe that this thing that has had me in a cycle, in this, uh, I can see it broken in Jesus' name. I can see chains broken. I can be that captive that's set free. Is there anyone in this room that believes that? Just wanna make sure I'm in the right room. Man, your friends, your family, your neighbors, they depend on you believing that God can do what he says he can do. So after all, after all, it is faith that moves God. Faith that's more than just words. Last Sunday, I just preached a message in my own church about faith with feet and how we dug through James 1 and 2 and how faith without works is dead. And everyone, you know what? Everyone says, oh, I got faith, 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 faith. What are we doing with faith? Because faith needs feet. Faith can't just be something we say. Just like love can't be something we say. Love is a verb, which means it's an action, which means I can't say I love you if I don't show you love if I don't do something for you. And so, so in the same way, we have to understand faith has motion. Faith needs to be in motion. And so let's look at all the ways Jesus worked the miracles and begin picturing ourselves and our friends and our neighbors in this story. Number one, sometimes all we need is a touch from Jesus. I just need a touch from Jesus. Jesus reached out his hand, it says in Matthew 8, and touch the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately he was clean. He was clean. Many of us know what a touch from Jesus can do, don't we? Yeah. There are many of us in this room right now. The fact that we are here right now is because we have had this inexplicable, undeniable touch from heaven. What Jesus has done for you, no one can take that away from you. But that's why our testimony is so powerful. Because you tell them what God has done for you. And no matter what they think about it, no matter what they say about it, it didn't change the fact that he did it. There's an inexplicable touch of Jesus that can change everything. Not only do I believe in Jesus, but he's also touched my life in a way that has changed me forever. We could pass the microphone around this room the rest of the time we have and just hear how Jesus has changed, healed, restored, fixed marriages, brought hope and future to the hopeless. A touch can change everything. Now look, a touch can look like him reaching out and touching us in response to our request, just like we read. But it could also look like us reaching out like the woman with the issue of blood and touching the hem of his garment. In fact, we see many healed from touching Jesus. Do you see, there, there's something that we can see. Let's just look at Matthew 14 real quick. When they had crossed over, they landed in Gennesaret, and when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent the word all around the surrounding countries. People brought all their sick to him, begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. See, some, sometimes, could it be that we're asking and waiting for Jesus to show up and touch us when he's waiting for us to put our faith in motion and reach out and touch him? Right. There's so many times we're saying, God, if you would just touch me. And God's saying, I'm right here. God's saying, come to me. 
God's saying, put feet on that faith. The woman that she had spent all of her money going to the doctors, she's done everything that science had said that they knew in that time, and she said that she thought, she believed, if I could just touch the hem of his garments, he can heal me. Sometimes I, I believe in the laying on of hands, I believe the anointing of oil, but sometimes you just need to go to Jesus yourself. Sometimes you got to stir something up in you that says, Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and I'm coming to you. I don't got time to wait. I'm coming to you. I'm going to push through the crowd. I'm going to reach out, and when I touch you, everything's going to change. Oh, maybe you're asking, is it time to act? Yes, it's time to act. Maybe you've been acting in every way you can to reach out and grasp it. But Jesus is saying, rest, I'll do it. Either way, a touch from Jesus is a touch from Jesus. We need to obey his word. A touch is all it takes. Number two, sometimes all we need is a word from Jesus. This can be harder because we're having to walk out the miracle. We're having to, sometimes knowing the miracle is on the way because we're told to go. It's, it's hard sometimes when, how many know we love to pray and see the miracle happen immediately? But how many know that oftentimes there's a process that God works through that's really hard? I gotta be patient sometimes. I've gotta believe God at his word. But sometimes the only thing I have left to hold on to is just his word. Matthew 8, 13, then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done for you just as you believed. He gave him a word. The centurion said, don't come to my house, just say it. Sometimes the word we need is the one we're not willing to accept from Jesus, though. The thing that could change and break everything in your life is the one you're avoiding because you know what he's going to say, but you're not ready to receive it. It's time to receive that word. It's time to take him at his word. It's time to allow him to break some things down because breakthrough is going to require allowing some walls to come down. But sometimes we don't need the touch. We just need a word. Many of you are familiar with another story that we read in the Gospels where 10 lepers were told to go and show themselves to the priests. And it was in their belief to go on his word on the way they were healed. Some of us, God had told us to go, and we're just waiting because we're not going to go until we see what we want to see. But God said, go, and it'll come when you go because you believed in me enough to go. And all we needed was the word that we put action on. Some of you say, man, I haven't heard God speak in so long. It's probably because you haven't put action on the last thing he said. We think God's going to, you, you're hoping God will give you another word because you didn't like the last one. That's not how God works. God said, oh, you heard me. Oh, you know. Go. Hmm. God, I don't really want to go. I just want to wait here. I want to sit on this bus stop and wait until you bring all these things to me. And once I have all of these things, then after I get all these things, I'll go. And God's like, I can't trust you with that. That's lazy. Get off your hands. Begin to work for God. Begin to take the word you know and go and go. Are you getting this? Tell your neighbor, go already. How about the story where Jesus told the leper to go and wash in the pool of Siloam, and he, was, he would be cleansed? Uh, the, the miracle was in the word of Jesus, but the process of putting feet on our faith is something that unlocks it. Jesus said, go. How many know that he wouldn't have been healed if he just stayed? Did it mean Jesus? Some say, oh, Jesus doesn't want me healed. Yeah, he does. He just said, go, and you're not going. He wants breakthrough in your life. But you've got to listen to the words of Jesus. What happens is we know that as he goes and he washes in the pool of Siloam, which pool of Siloam means sent, as he goes, we see the healing. Uh, why? No, no, so let me just take a sidebar. Last time I was with you in the Young Adults, I actually talked about this very story a year ago, last, this week, I guess. And, and the thing that drives me crazy is sometimes we see God heal the leper with a touch, Sometimes we see God heal the leper. Uh, you know, he reaches out and touches or has them reach out their arm and they're healed. But why this way? And I believe it's pretty, pretty um, freeing when you understand that that is to speak to all of us who have to walk through the process. Because sometimes your miracle is going to come on the back of a process. And there's so many times in the word that the process is powerful because it's obedient to the word 
that gave us the process. Are, are you getting this? So go, your servant has been made well. And he went, and in the going, putting the feet on his faith, we saw the miracle. Number three, sometimes we need a friend who will go to Jesus for us. What kind of friend are you? We're talking about this man in verse 5. It says, when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed. The servant couldn't go to Jesus. Do you know there are friends that you've been praying for? that you should be praying for. Uh, but here's the thing. Sometimes your friends aren't in a place to be able to do the very thing they need to do, and it's time for you to be the kind of friend that stands in the gap for them, the kind of friend that you come to the altar because they're not going to come to the altar. You begin praying for them. You begin seeking Jesus for them. You become the conduit for which God can work through because your faith matters. And so sometimes we, we, we need a touch from Jesus. Sometimes we need a word from Jesus. But sometimes we need to be that person that's going to go and go to Jesus for our friends. Uh, it says, but just, as, uh, just say the word and my servant will be healed. What kind of Jesus do you believe in? See, some people needed the touch. Some people understood, I just need a word. What kind of friend do you have? We talked a lot about friends last night. It was a hot topic. The people that you spend the most time around, you'll become. You put two rotten apples in a bushel. The bushel doesn't make the rotten ones good. It makes all of them bad. Bad company corrupts good character, the scripture says. What kind of friends are you surrounding yourself with? What kind of friend are you to someone else? It's time for us to stand in the gap for those. There, we're, uh, we're seeing a third service opens because your friends need to be saved. Your family needs to be saved. Your family needs to experience the Jesus that can do all things. But what kind of friend are you going to be? My hope is to see that third service full because you guys have decided that I'm going to be the kind of friend that doesn't just wait for the door to open. I'm going to be the kind of friend that brings them to Jesus. I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring the, the cares, the concerns. Your friends lay all the hard things on you about what's going on in their life, and you lay them at God's feet saying, come on, I know you can do the miracle. Come on, let's give this testimony back to you. Come on, let's see them turn around. Let's see this life change that I would see them, rather than snorting lines, being in line to get in church. How many friends can you call on and ask them to go to Jesus for you? If that's not a big number, you need better friends. Do you realize as a Christian, it's important for your best friends, your closest circle to the people, be the people that are closest to Jesus? Someone goes, I can't believe he just told me to leave all of my friends. No, no, no. Pray for your friends. Go to Jesus for your friends. But be Jesus to your friends. If you change who you are when you're around them to be accepted, you worship their applause more than heaven. Someone asked me last night on a sidebar, how do I escape the, the feeling and the need to be approved by everyone else? I said, you've got to get this revelation that if the whole world sits down just with this bitter beer face looking at you, just this, this pickle juice, they're all sitting upset at you, but... God in heaven's on his feet giving you the applause. As long as we live for the applause of one, nothing else matters. What we do is about him, not about them. And if it's about him, then about them is different. It's not about getting their applause. It's about leading them to Jesus. What kind of friend are we to the people? Think of the people that brought the lame man to Jesus, carried him. They brought him up onto the roof. They tore the roof open. They lowered him down. That is some people that you need in your corner. When you're crippled, when you're struggling with things, do you have the kind of friends that are going to bring you to Jesus? Are you getting this? Okay, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I just get excited. Do you realize who we rub shoulders with affects us for the negative and the positive? So do you have the friends that will work to get you to Jesus, to keep you walking with Jesus, that will call you when they don't see you at church, that actually care about your eternity, not just about how you think about them or them think about you? Our, our, our relationships, do you understand that we're not of this world? So if our relationships are only about how we feel on this world, we're missing it. 
we're missing it because actually we're trying to get everyone to go to the place that we're going, God willing. And that's not going to happen by just tiptoeing around people. It's, I said it last night, clarity is kindness. What does that mean? Sometimes we say the hard things because a wound from a friend is better than a kiss from an enemy. Going to Jesus, bringing them to Jesus is also important to understand. Uh, I'm going to bring their concerns to Jesus, but as I go to them, I'm bringing Jesus to them. I'm not just going to be like, okay, well, I've been praying they come to church. It's not Pastor Julian's responsibility to save your friend. God's looking, you have a sphere of influence that only you have the ability to reach. Uh, there are people that say, oh man, Pastor Chad, I brought someone, I've been praying for him. I'm, I'm bringing him to church next week. I'm believing God's going to do something. I said, well, what are you doing in the meantime? Are you praying about them? Are you trying to open up the right conversations that are going to help them understand the gospel when they sit down? Or are we just kind of throwing in the new babies going, okay, fix them? What kind of friend am I? What kind of friend are you? Deuteronomy tells us that with God's help, one can chase away a thousand, but two set to flight 10,000. Don't tell me your friends aren't important. Don't tell me the kind of friend you are isn't important. So having strong faith-filled friends will help you along in this life. Number four, we're called to bring people to Jesus. I know I already let the cat out of the bag. I was too excited. You're like, you already said that. Well, it's a point, okay? So you need to write the point down. If you want a hundred thousand points in the game of life you need to write that down so number three sometimes we need a friend who will go to jesus for us number four we're called to bring all people to jesus we're called to be part of someone else's miracle part of someone else's story see what's interesting is is the currency that we use on earth is stuff isn't it it's stuff. It's, you know, we, we're, we know that the scripture says don't store up for yourselves, uh, you know, all the things that moth and rust can destroy, right? But I believe when we get to heaven, the most valuable thing we'll ever hear is someone saying, wow, what you did changed my life. It changed my eternity. There'll be people you never even knew you had influence in their life, but because you were just willing to be authentic, raw Christian, raw authentic. I'm going to write a book about it someday. But it, just this ability to just be raw, who you are. And the influence that God's going to use through your life, there are going to be people that say, look, I know you have no clue. You've never met me, but you talked to Tommy, who talked to Jenny, who talked to Susie, who invited me, and I've come now in the earth to understand, in heaven to understand what you did. You created a domino. My whole family became Christ followers because you were willing to open your mouth. You were willing to love on us. I know there's going to be a lot of time in heaven to talk in between all the worship breaks. But I believe it's going to be these moments that we talk about where there was a spiritual exchange that we weren't even aware of. Because it's going to be a long time to meet new family members. We're called to bring people to Jesus. And you're making new space. You're bringing a new vessel with this service. You're bringing a new opportunity with this time. The time slot is interesting too. You have such an amazing opportunity that there's no more, well, there's not enough seats, so I can't invite my friends. Oh, we made new seats. It's about us being the kind of people that bring people to Jesus. Are you getting this? Because here's the key. Every situation, the breakthrough's in Jesus. Whether it's with a touch, whether it's with a word, whether we're, you know, whether someone's, you're bringing someone's concern to Jesus and he's being able to speak into that thing, or whether you're literally bringing them to Jesus, Jesus, breakthrough is in him. How many people have some friends that could use some breakthrough? How many people have some needs that they could use some breakthrough? Does your worship look like this then? Man, God, I need you. We need you. This city needs you. This region needs you. This world needs you. But what am I going to do about it? We shouldn't see evangelism only for evangelists. We shouldn't shy away from sharing our faith. We shouldn't shrink back when it comes to inviting people to experience Jesus. We shouldn't see the call to bring people to Jesus as an inconvenience, rather a miracle we get to be a part of. You know, it was difficult for that woman to push through the crowd. She, she was considered unclean. She wasn't supposed to be there. She wasn't supposed to be pushing through. She wasn't supposed to be touching all these other people. She wasn't supposed to. 
What is the world telling you that you're not supposed to, but it's the exact thing that if you do, you will see the breakthrough? If you would just, you're not supposed to talk about that. You're not supposed to have that moment. You're not supposed to say that. You're not supposed to. That's where we find the breakthrough. When we're willing to push beyond the world's limits and expectations to see what heaven can do if we can just get a touch. Tell your neighbor that's good. I'm spilling water everywhere, Pastor Julian. Just is what it is. Matthew 8, 16. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. All the sick. Not some of the sick. Not a few of the sick people. All the sick people that were brought to Jesus. Something changed. Breakthrough isn't the lottery ball. Breakthrough isn't something only for some. It's for all the some that would come to Jesus. Are you getting that? See, it's not about, I wonder if that person's life could change. It's about if they get before heaven and they touch Jesus, they can't not. My evangelism, the way I started to reach people changed when I realized it's not up to me about whether they get saved. I remember the message I preached. I was just throwing bird seed all over the church. Just throwing seed. People getting it in their hair. They were not happy. I was like new to leading. You know, I was a youth pastor for 15 years. And so I was like, you know, first year into senior pastor. And I don't think people liked it. But the point was, I'm not responsible for the seed to grow. I'm responsible to sow. And so, you know what? I'm going to keep sowing. And know what? Some of this stuff's going to grow, but I'm not going to be held back by the world's expectations or by what the world says is too far. I'm going to do my part and see what God will do. Some of you need to start sowing without expectations. Well, I don't know if I... No, sow. What I've also come to realize is the more you talk about Jesus, the more accountable it is in your own life to stay walking for Jesus. Some people don't want to talk about Jesus because they live like hell. They don't want the accountability. But when I start talking about Jesus, I want to be more like him. I want to learn the word more so that when they ask questions, I actually know what to tell them. It actually is a self. It's like you're putting like spiritual grow in your own life when you start talking about Jesus. It's a contagious thing. I'm running out of time. That's what normally happens. I blame you. Maybe today you need to be reminded that we don't just pray for people. We're called to bring people to Jesus. The story in Luke 5, I told you about it. These men carrying their friend to Jesus, lowering him through the roof. It's easy to qualify why we would rather be silent about our faith and keep it a personal conviction rather than being a vocal disciple. But our justification will fall on deaf ears before a God who has commissioned us to go. We're called to be ambassadors of Christ. The scripture says that we're called to make an appeal to the world to reconcile with God. That doesn't look like some of the Christians, some of the churches, some of the places I go where they actually see it more as like I checked off the box. I'm a Christian because my parents and my grandparents were a Christian. Can I promise you no one is riding coattails into heaven based on what your parents or grandparents prayed for you? You're going to stand before God and have to give account of what you decided to do with the life he gave you. Matthew 28, as I close. Matthew 28. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Say make disciples. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the very last thing Jesus tells us before he ascends back to the right hand of the Father and the very thing that he's interceding on our behalf about is that we would put feet on our faith and that we would go and make. Making is an action. Make, Christianity is about what we do, not just what we think. What we think, I was telling them last night, what's in our head eventually gets to our heart and what's in our heart eventually comes out of our mouth. The question is, when's the last time you talked about Jesus? Because out of the abundance of the heart, 
the mouth speaks. I want to challenge you. If you don't talk about Jesus, how important is Jesus? I know I'm the guest speaker and I'm supposed to be liked. I, I just want to leave asking a hard question. If I claim that my whole life is about Jesus, what's coming out of my heart on a daily basis? Would you bow your head and close your eyes? What is coming out of our hearts? God loves you. He's passionate about you. He knows the, the number of hairs on your head or the lack thereof. He loves you even though you did what you did last night. His future for you is still the best yet to come if it's in his hands. And so today with, today with every head bowed and every eye closed, I don't want to embarrass you. I wouldn't want to, want to call you out of the crowd. I, I Just for a moment, while no one else is looking around, I want to give you an opportunity to understand your faith is not based on your family ties. Your faith is based on believing in your heart and confessing with your lips that Jesus is Lord. So I want to draw a line, a proverbial line, just as Moses did when he came down from the Ten Commandments. And this proverbial line is to say, just like Moses said, anyone who is on the Lord's side, come over here. No more of this, yeah, I have faith. No, are you on the Lord's side? So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I just want to say a prayer right for you, right where you sit. Maybe this is the first time you've ever said yes to Jesus. Maybe this is the first time that you've, you're shifting from just being an attender who goes to church to someone who is now understanding to become the church is to become a son and daughter of Christ, of our God. Maybe you've walked away and you know you need to get right. Maybe you're realizing that faith in word is not faith in deed and you're asking God to forgive you because it's time to cross that line. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one else looking around. If you're saying, Pastor Chad, include me in that prayer. I want to experience God's grace, his forgiveness, his mercy. I want to be called a son and a daughter. I want to know where I stand with God the most high. Then quickly in this moment, just slip up your hand and say, pray for me right where you are. I see that hand over there, right where you are. I see those hands back there, right where you are, that hand there, right where you are. God sees your heart. I see that hand too. You can all put your hands down. But I believe there's an activation moment when we say yes to Jesus. The same way the leper who wanted healing reached out his arm, I believe there's a powerful moment in reaching out our arm. And so I want to lead us all in this prayer. Why don't we say, Father, I thank you for loving me so much. You sent your only son, Jesus, for me. I don't deserve him, but today I accept him. Jesus, come into my heart. Father, forgive me. Holy Spirit, help me. I'm going to need a lot of help, but today I give you my life. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give a huge hand to God and all those people that made that decision. Thanks for joining us today. We hope this message encouraged you and really built your faith. Remember to subscribe and join us live every Sunday morning. See you soon.